Good afternoon and welcome to the first of two programs today featuring the finalists of the 2018 Dominic J. Pellicciotti Opera Composition Prize. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us by the live stream on the web. I'm Kirk Sievertson. I'm on the faculty here at the Crane School of Music and music director of the Crane Opera Ensemble. It's a beautiful, gorgeous fall weekend. It's September here in, in Potsdam, New York, and we are so pleased to welcome all of our distinguished guests to campus, composers, librettists, dramaturgs, and members of the selection panel. They've made their way to campus this weekend, as well as those members, uh, family members of students who are here for family weekend at SUNY Potsdam. The Dominic Pellicciotti Prize seeks to encourage the creation of new operatic works that in some way explore themes rated, related to tolerance, inclusion, or diversity. Dr. Gary Jakeway, SUNY Potsdam class of 1967, generously established this project in memory of his partner, Dominic Pellicciotti, who was an ardent fan of opera. Dr. Jakeway embraced and encouraged the idea for this award here at the Crane School of Music as a way to encourage student engagement in the world of opera and to provide incredible special opportunities to our students to participate in the process of the creation of new works and to meet and interact with composers and librettists and other opera professionals. Gary, we are honored and grateful for your vision and support of this, this project. Could you please stand? The Pellicciotti Prize was inaugurated in 2014 with staged performances by the Crane Opera Ensemble of three works from among those submitted to us as completed works in the first competition cycle. For this current cycle, we asked not for proposals of completed works, but instead ideas for proposed works from composers or composers and librettist teams. The selection panel reviewed all of those that were submitted last December, and we selected four finalists to commission 20-minute scenes of their proposed work, which you will hear today between this program and our later program at 5 p.m. this afternoon. From these four, the panel has the difficult task of selecting just one project for a full commission and eventual production in November 2018, right here on this stage by the Crane Opera Ensemble and Orchestra. I'd like to introduce members of the selection panel, which includes several Crane faculty, as well as distinguished opera professionals. You can read the full bios for each in the program beginning on page six. Corey Ellison is our consulting dramaturg who teaches at the... <laughs> Corey teaches at the Juilliard School and also serves as dramaturg at the Glyndebourne Festival, among many other things. Mark Campbell is a noted and prolific opera librettist who also serves as mentor to librettists as they learn their craft. Mark. <laughs> Francois Germain is a member of the Crane faculty as pianist and vocal coach, and he will be at the piano for these performances. Carlene Graham, who is watching today via the web, who until recently was director of the Crane Opera Ensemble, is now director of Houston Grand Opera's HGO co-program. <laughs> Nicole Paymont is artistic director of Opera Parallel in San Francisco and principal guest conductor at the Dallas Opera. She's especially known as a conductor for her work commissioning, premiering, and recording many new works. Nicole. <laughs> Tim Sullivan is a composer and is on the faculty here at Crane and serves as the chair of the Theory, History, and Composition Department. <laughs> and 
And finally, Darren Keith Woods, who is active in many ways in the world of opera. He serves as general director of Fort Worth Opera, and he's no stranger to the North Country region of New York, as he serves as artistic director for the Siegel Music Colony, uh, just a short drive away in Scroon Lake during the summers. Darren. So this first program will feature the world premiere of scenes from two of these four finalist works, Albert Knobs and Mayo, found in your program on pages two and three. We'll have the composer and librettist introduce each of their works, then you'll hear a performance by students and faculty from Crane, and immediately following each performance, we'll invite the, the composer or composer and librettist back to the stage with Darren Woods, who will moderate an audience feedback session, which he'll explain a little bit about to you. So be, please be thinking about the works as you hear them performed and questions that you might ask the creators. We'll take a brief intermission between the two works immediately after the first feedback session. So first up is Albert Knobs, and I'd like to invite librettist Deborah Brevoort and composer Patrick Saluri to introduce their work. opera, Albert Knobs, is based on the novella by George Moore, and it tells the story of a painfully shy uh, butler in a 19th century hotel in Dublin, Ireland, who hides an incredible secret. He is really a she. Uh, as a young woman, uh, Albert had been forced by circumstances to pose as a man in order to avoid going to the poorhouse or to the whorehouse, which at the time were the only options that were available to women without means. Uh, she successfully lived uh, as a man for 20 years by staying completely to herself and focusing solely on her work. The selection that you will see today takes place towards the beginning of the opera. The scene opens with Albert counting her tips and getting ready for bed in her butler's room in the, uh, uh, at, at the hotel. Mr. Baker, uh, the hotel owner, knocks on the door and informs Albert that a day laborer, a Mr. Hubert Page, will board for the night in Albert's room. And what follows is a series of revelations that will uh, change Albert's life forever. Uh, Hubert Page discovers that Albert is a woman, and Albert discovers that Hubert is also a woman, and what more, Hubert is married to a woman. Um, so basically what you're seeing is the inciting incident that launches uh, the entire opera. And the discoveries that are made in this scene will awaken for Albert the possibility of a life that includes love and uh, companionship and will set her off on a passionate and desperate and ultimately tragic journey to find a wife of her own while maintaining her disguise as a man. I'm telling you the story uh, so that you won't be confused when you see two lovely women walk on stage and start calling each other Albert and Hubert. Um, <laughs> uh, in the production, they would be disguised as men, and you would see, hopefully, what you think are two men. Uh, the rest of the action of the scene should be pretty clear, but there is one word that needs explaining. Uh, Hubert tells Albert that they are perhapsers. And this being Ireland in the year 1863, and a very repressive time for women and homosexuals, they had no words for who they were. They didn't even know who they were. Uh, are they transgender? This was not even a concept back then. So they called themselves perhapsers, perhaps a man, perhaps a woman. Um, Albert Knobs is a story about identity and the profound difficulty of being true to oneself in a society where there aren't even words to say what you are, and where who you are, whatever you are, is not allowed or tolerated. Thank you. So as the uh, composer for this piece, one of the challenges is how do you create a sound world that evokes the story and the characters? And uh, with this story, I mean, it takes place essentially in a Downton Abbey kind of world, um, but we're in Ireland, so do we evoke Irish music? Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting challenge, and 
also as we get to know the characters, how do you show a character that starts out incredibly repressed and then through the course of the story, as we're following them through the story, that person opens up um, and discovers new parts of themselves. So the way that I approached it, well, there's several ways I approached it. Um, it's, uh, I write music, first of all, in an, with full orchestra. I don't start at the piano, I start writing full score, and then at the end, I'll write a piano reduction. So some of this you're not really gonna hear, unfortunately, on the piano <laughs> reduction, um, but just to give you an idea, the, uh, some of the choices that were made were uh, we use, I use um, for the percussion, the bodron is a very typical Irish instrument. So how do you do that in a Western orchestral context? And I decided, well, rototoms would be a great way to do that. So you kind of have the different pitches which they would make by changing, by pushing on the head of the drum. So we kind of evoke that a little bit, but it's not too much. Um, the fiddle is a very common instrument, so there would be a lot of solo violin within the context, but not played in a fiddle way, but more in, in a, again, sort of a more lyrical context. Uh, and then the use of a harp, not a Aeolian harp or Irish harp, but still a traditional Western harp. So we're kind of slightly evoking those without being too heavy handed, because this is a story that could take place essentially anywhere, anytime. The idea is that it's someone that could be 150 years ago or it could be today. So the musical journey of our character, um, Albert Nobbs, the first scene, she actually doesn't even say anything. She's just there quietly in the hotel, everything's happening around her. And the second scene where we open up in the bedroom, uh, her, her singing is very staccato, it's very short. You know, she's a repressed person who doesn't sing yet. So as we move into our second scene and Hubert starts to sort of open up her world, she starts to sing a little bit. So as we were to move forward in the piece, um, which you're not gonna hear at this point, but hopefully we will, is she really starts to sing and you'll have an aria. So it's as she's opening up vocally, she's opening up as well. And then we start her in her lower tessitura. Uh, again, we're, it's a woman dressed as a man, so we're sort of in the lower part of the, of the voice. And then as we move along, she, the, the tessitura raises. So we're trying to use all these different ways to hopefully illustrate our character's journey and the story itself.
Mr. Nobbs.
A, a form of feedback and what will there be four different types of feedback that we're going to talk about first is we will ask you to do statements of meaning what was meaningful to you about what you just saw and heard what blew you away what you really liked and these are meant to be positive statements about the artist and the reason we start with those is a lot of times artists are focusing on what they what they're the problems they've got to solve further in the piece or or what may not be going well for them if anything and so oftentimes they don't pay attention to what's really great so we want you to start by, out by saying what you really liked about the piece the second is the artist will if they have questions for you the audience and they may choose to ask you a couple of questions about what you thought about the piece uh, again these are uh, it's it's supposed to be they're supposed to ask you things that a call for an articulate answer and not just a yes or no answer. So they're, they're to be thoughtful. Then the third uh, section are neutral questions. And these are described as um, audience asks neutral questions to the artist about the work and the artist's answer. Questions are neutral when they do not have an opinion embedded in them. And my friend Larry Adelson uh, offers this uh, example. Uh, a negative a question would be, why did you make chocolate cake? That implies that you hate chocolate cake, right? The better question in a neutral question is, what guided your choice in the flavor of cake that you made? That takes the opinion out, so clear? And, and I'll be really on you about that, because I may ask you to rephrase it. If, it. if it contains an opinion, we'll have to rephrase the question. And the fourth is opinions. Uh, but this is a way where you have to form the, the question in, I have an opinion about the pacing of the first section of what I just heard. Would you like to hear it? and the artists are free to say yes or no to that question. <laughs> if they say yes, then you may offer your opinion, and if they say no, uh, then, and usually it, it's no, it's they, they already know that there's something that they're working on in that section, and they want to be, feel free to process that alone uh, without any, any input. So those are the four sections we're gonna do. We're gonna take about 15 minutes to do that, and Kurt's gonna be my timer, because I, I, I usually am pretty good about keeping track, but my grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher, and we weren't always uh, on time. All right. Okay, you guys don't have mics, so you'll have to shout out. So statements of meaning, what, 
what really spoke to you about what you just saw? Anything? I will start by saying I really loved the way the, the music really set the text. When it, was, when it was very tentative, when Albert was tentative, it was the, the music really, really set that up. And, and I love the way as, as Albert was discovering um, that Hubert was so calm and Albert became calmer as it went and the music really, really set that up really beautifully. Yes. Terrific. Somebody else? Yes. I thought that Rayfield uh, underlined turbulence that was really important in this sort of seemingly innocent portrayal and the text. There was a lot of turbulence. Good. Yeah. Great. Somebody else? Yeah. I love uh, the writing. I love the use of small, banal items to indicate very large parts of daily life. The sound of the chain and the breeze that may or may not even exist. They say so much. Good. Anybody else? Do you guys have questions that you would like to ask the audience? Sure, I have a couple. Um, I guess the first is, is always the librettist question, and that is, could you understand the text? Um, uh, and what was it clear? Were you ever lost? Was there any place where the text was muddy? And in particular, um, you know, the, this whole perhapser thing, which is a word we don't know. Um, and uh, I know I helped you out a little bit in my introduction, but uh, uh, was, it, uh, was it clear? That's my first question. <laughs> Great. Any, was there any time, because uh, Deborah asked a very specific question, was there any time where you felt it, it could have been clear or um, that, it, that, that, you, that you were sort of leaning and trying to, to figure out something? <clears throat> yeah. And I'm so not even at the sure height. Mozart got 99%, so that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, well, it's your question. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. So this opera is about Albert Nobbs, so it's extremely important that we care for Albert Nobbs. And this scene, we're setting up uh, an introduction to Albert. So my, even though we only have two scenes so far, I guess my question is, are you starting to relate to Albert Nobbs? Are you starting to sympathize to Albert Nobbs? Do you feel like you're starting to get to know who this person is?
Thank you. Terrific. Yeah. That's great because one of the, we didn't really address it, but I'm glad it came across because this is someone who is essentially obsessed with money and trying to save money and trying to create a future. Um, so she's sort of obsessed with money and counting and this sort of becomes a, um, a trope throughout the entire piece, but then it gets overshadowed by her desire for trying to find someone to fall in love. So that's, um, I'm glad you picked up on that because that's actually a really important thing because it also ends up being part of her undoing a little later. Yeah, go ahead. Like, even though you've just met her, did that seem like, oh, this is strange, this person's reacting so strongly? Yes, but it, like in a good way, like that, right. that spoke volumes as to work. I hope we find out why she's right. so frantic and, and what's going on here, because it was an immediate transformation of sure. what seemed like a, a recent past. Somebody over here? Yes. Um, was it clear that, so uh, w you picked up on that, which is great, because when, um, uh, when the hotel owner essentially says, you're going to, you need to stay here and just share a bed, doesn't think that it's going to be a problem, Albert always is, says yes, is considered a yes man, is the only person in the hotel that actually listens to the hotel owner. <laughs> so when he says no, the hotel owner gets really <coughs> upset. Uh, because this is so uncharacteristic for Albert. So I'm, I'm also curious, do we get a sense, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I, we try to show it in the music and in the text, but this very quick reaction to anger, which seems to d escalate, that then, so the end of that scene where he says, you have to stay here, but did that come across? I thought. Great. Yeah, I think it's really interesting and terrific that, uh, that you get so much of that when, when we know from what you've told us in this that he was a yes man, even though we don't get to see that part of him. So it, 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 might, it was very successful in that, I think. Do you guys have questions? These are neutral questions you'd like to ask him about the piece, its creation, what you saw? Yes. Well, uh, in the underlying, uh, this, this was actually the, the, the challenge of the piece, because in this one scene, you have three major revelations, which are usually all you get in a full-length opera. <laughs> and, you know, and in fact, the, the movie that was made of it took those revelations and spread it out over the full length you know, uh, 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 of, the, of the piece. But I felt it was important to have them right in the same, um, in the same scene, so I mean that was the writing challenge of to have three major reversals happen in a less than uh, ten minutes. But um, uh, 
what I am trying to do, I mean, I'm trying to set up what's going to come later, and that is that you have a person who, uh, Albert Nobbs, who is so incredibly repressed. She's so repressed that she doesn't even sing or speak uh, in the scenes that precede this. Um, and that these revelations have the effect of basically breaking the shell so that by the end of this scene, she's like the, the bird that, pop, that is born out of the shell. The shell gets broken. And I felt that each sort of attack on that shell needed uh, a moment where uh, we see a little bit of uh, uh, where, you know, she starts suddenly crying in ex, you know, I I'm lonely, I'm suddenly lonely. I didn't realize my life was so sad. And uh, so that I give her like little, I don't know, little baby steps emotionally um, because there's another punch coming later. There's two more coming later, right? You know, and so I'm, I'm trying to gradually, um, you know, get her to that final breaking out of the shell. But that, that's a really good question because, you know, that's, the, that's a question I have about how big do you make those moments or how small do you make them and what's the balance and um, that's something I'm still wrestling with. But that's an excellent question. And also um, keep in mind that both of these women are dressing as men for survival. Like Albert's been doing this for 20 years so that she could have a job. So in the same way that I think a lot of us dealt with things in the recession, like we made choices we didn't necessarily think we were gonna make, the situation around her forced her into that situation and forced Hubert into that situation. So it's not like they're just gonna let everyone know so easily because it could affect their lives. And I think at that time there was a law that, um, what, two women living together would be, actually, well, the year before this, they would hang gay people in Ireland. So, but the capital punishment had just stopped, and then if you were caught being who they were, you were sent to the whorehouse. Basically, it was the women were sent there to show them what they were missing or something. I don't know, but um, you know. So, there's a lot at stake in any revelation. So, yeah. Another question. Uh, opinions. Remember, you can ask, you had to share your opinion if the artist would like to hear it. Does anybody have any opinion? We have about three minutes. We're happy to hear anything, so <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> yes. Is, is there a scene in the uh, opera in which, right now, you've you told us all of the consequences that could happen, and so we have to come in with a little bit of knowledge, you know, about Oscar Wilde, about this, you know, whole society that is there anything in this opera where we get to hear from these two characters what the consequences are, what could happen? I know drama, you know, because I've, I've read it, of course, but do we get to hear Albert Knox um, say, if my secret is revealed, I am dead? It, uh, an aria or anything like that? Well, we, there's two things that happen, and one is that um, uh, the end of Act One is Hubert Page, who goes back to Belfast, is aroused in the middle of the night by the constable who has realized that Hubert is a woman in disguise and she and her wife are taken to the, to the whorehouse. Um, and uh, so we see the consequence. Um, for Albert, um, that's also a really good question because um, Albert is an innocent. And um, I mean, I, for her being exposed, she, I, she knows she has to go to the whorehouse or the poorhouse, but um, she does begin a journey looking for love, and all of her repression has made her innocent, as opposed to twisted, because the world wasn't quite so worldly then, right? She didn't have all that information, and so she kind of innocently begins the pursuit for a wife, not fully aware of the enormous danger that she has put herself into, and that ultimately she falls into. So, um, so we um, kind of, sort of, <laughs> Does that answer your question? But that's how we sort of dealt with that issue. We, we show Hubert and, Al, uh, Hubert and Hubert's wife being dragged out by the constable. That's the end of Act One. Well, my timekeeper is telling us it's time to take a 10 minute break. So thank you to our creators. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we'll see you at group three.
job for
welcome back. I'd like to introduce the composer and librettist of the second piece on this program. The piece is called Mayo, and the composer and librettist for this work is Tom Chapulo. <laughs> Hello. For this very lovely weekend, I'd like to thank SUNY Potsdam, President Esterberg, uh, Dean Sitton, the wonderful performers you've just heard and are about to hear, and especially Kirk Sievertson. And of course, I'd very much like to thank Dr. Gary Jakeway for his vision for this wonderful Pelachati Prize. Mayo is a love story. What may make it a bit unusual is its setting, the Iowa home for feeble-minded children, the real-life place where the real-life Mayo Buckner spent over a half century of his life. What also may make it a bit unusual is the eugenics movement that was so prevalent in the United States in the last decades of the 19th century and the first five decades of the 20th century. Based on a, a perverted view of Darwin, this eugenics theory uh, posited the idea that the human race was in trouble because of defective genes that needed to be stamped out. Across the nation, at lots of state and county fairs, one might see a display under the, a heading that said, America's search for more, for fitter families. And a, there might be a big banner that would say, some people are born to be a burden on the rest. And there would be a light that flashed every seven seconds. This is how often a baby is born in America. Or a light that flashed every 15 seconds. And it would say, every 15 seconds, $100 of your tax money is being spent on supporting people in institutions. And then there was another light that might flash every seven and a half minutes, and that was supposedly when a highly developed person was born, about 4% of the population. What was going to happen to the other 96% of the population? Well, eventually, this attitude led to state laws in about half the states of the country uh, that led to forced sterilizations for tens of thousands of people. Eventually, these laws went to the Supreme Court where Oliver Wendell Holmes, in support of states' rights to coerce people into these sterilizations, he wrote his famous uh, decision, Buck versus Bell, with the phrase, three generations of imbeciles are enough. You won't see Mayo Buckner today on stage as an adult. You won't hear him sing, although you will hear him speak as a boy a few lines. We start with a prologue, a very, very brief prologue, just a few spoken lines between Mayo and his mother as they travel on the overnight train. The first scene is set in, a, in an American city, it could be any city in America, around the year 1900. It was inspired by a photograph, this scene. In this photograph, there are a group of men holding signs. Behind them, another group of men laugh at them or snicker at them. The signs say things like, I cannot read the sign. By what right do I have children? Or a sign that says, I am a burden to myself and to the state. Shall I be allowed to propagate? Well, as I, as I saw, uh, as I looked at this photo, four questions came to me. One, how much were these men being paid to hold these signs? Was it enough for a decent meal? And then my second question was, when did they know what those signs said? I bet some of them could read. And even if they couldn't read, we know pretty quickly when someone is trying to humiliate us. We feel that very quickly. My third question was, what did they do with the money when they got paid? And my fourth question was, what kind of depraved person tries to make a point by humiliating other people? How sick is that, I thought. 
So, but I wanted this scene as a, as a background to the eugenics movement. So I wrote it and I said, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna reimagine this a little bit. And this time, these, these marchers who hold these signs, they're gonna outsmart these men who procure them and they're gonna get more money than they want. And at the end of it, they're gonna, they're gonna be able to say what they did with the money. Because as we know, art is this great tool for settling the score, you know, and rewriting history. And then um, in, in this uh, first scene, you'll also see uh, an aria, a tenor aria, as one of the eugenists, eugenicists uh, says his creed. Um, in the second scene, again, on a darkened stage, we hear, we do not see, for the first time, women singing voices a chorus preparing a hymn. And then the second scene is set in the institution where Mrs. Buckner is dropping off her eight-year-old son and is being interviewed by the superintendent. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, young Mayo asks one question, and the mother does not answer the question, though, but instead comments on the autumn weather. I said Mayo was a love story, but I didn't tell you what kind of love story. There is a romance, as the real life Mayo Buckner did have a romance, but also there's a second type of love, as Mayo and the other inmates in this institution forge a bond together. And there's a third type of love, as Mayo learns to love himself, which is a difficult thing to do when people tell you, you are defective or the child of a lesser God. A quote from Charles Dickens to conclude my introduction from our mutual friend. A quote I hope our nation uh, learns and never forgets. No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of it for another. I hope you like mail. that You don't have a job, you have no prospect. 
get 50 cents. That's exactly right. than a buck. No cash on the barrel, no checks, certainly no personal checks, no notes, no bonds, no company script, no IOUs. You're crook, a cheat, and no account thief. You're a goddamn scoundrel. That's exactly right.
some very good whiskey. I don't doubt it.
Yes, that's our girls' chorus rehearsing for the Sunday service. <laughs> Good, don't you think? We have lots of activities for the young men and women in our care. But music. Remarkable, really, the talent they have for music. Some studies have adjusted the end of the link between musical ability and feeble mindedness. Of course, I'm not 100% convinced until I see more data. Questions, Mrs. Buckner. How would you describe the child's general health? Food, very good. Still, he is delicate, and excitement will make him ill. Does it often run away? Does it know right from wrong? Oh, 
Okay, we're back again. So, wow. Um, statements of, uh, what did you take from that? What, what blew you away? What was meaningful? Anybody? Yes. Thank you, thank you. You know that means the world to me. I know a great mezzo aria, right? Yay, yeah, mezzos. <laughs> yes. Anybody? Anybody else? Yeah. I think all my pieces sound exactly the same. <laughs> I can tell you that's not true. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I really admired the energy and the piece, especially the music, and the music that was very much in the music. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are getting good at this. Anything else? This is really pleasant, this feedback. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very lucky to have these performers who have such distinct styles and really uh, brought character to it, I think. I think someone's up there? Yep. Were you just stretching or did you have comments? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Up there. I wish I could say that was conscious. I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> never, until, never admit not knowing that you're brilliant. It's just, <laughs> there was one more, I think. So, yeah. You right there. Thank you, because actually, at that point where I was going to ask the audience questions, that was the, that was the question now, I was so going to ask. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you. And, um, you know, I was at an artist retreat once, and there was a, a, I was lucky I was there with this very famous composer. I, well, I can say his name. It was Ned Roram. And I happened to corner him one night, and he asked me, what are you working on? And he, I said, uh, I'm writing an opera. This was when I was working on my first one. And he said, put in lots of instrumental interludes. <laughs> And you know, I didn't, I didn't ask him, we got interrupted then, I never got a chance to ask him why, but you don't argue with him, you know, I just did it. So, um, and I put them in, but things happen on stage, you know, maybe the marchers put down their signs, you know, but I, you really do need time like that. So my question is, do the instrumental interludes seem appropriate, do they seem long, do they, you know, do they seem to fit? Both those gentlemen off the record. Our superintendent with a heart. <laughs> I appreciate the eloquence and elegance of your musical gesture. I appreciate, above all, the manner in which you treat the character development with the music, which makes it for us who are trying to find characters in this music, uh, it's almost it's almost self-evident. The, the story is told through the music, and this is for Thank you very much. Yes? Oh, it's your question. Did we want to answer that question again? Or do you have another question? I have one other question, and that is I gave uh, Lionel Woods the craziest, this aria with so many words. <laughs> I, I don't know how he learned it so fast. And, but, it's not the and first there, time you've done that, you know. Uh, <laughs> and there, there are so many words, and they're complicated words, and maybe I shouldn't have made the words so complicated. Um, but I'm wondering if you could get, if not, I think it's impossible maybe to get every word, but do you get enough of the flavor of it to feel it? And be honest. <laughs> you were great, Lana. He, and he was terrific, right? I mean, he did, you know, he did it so beautifully. That's a tribute to Lanell then, definitely not. Yes, right there. Interesting. A frenzy that creates the character gets in the way sometimes. Maybe I can defrenzify it. And, and, you know, I wonder if I could do it with, instead of, you know, we have the piano, if it's all pizzicato strings, is it somehow easier on the singer and make it possible more? Is there a scoring thing I can do? I don't know, but it's a moment that's, a, that's fraught with danger. The, well, this is, do you want to answer that question or? Okay, go ahead. Um, it, it always brought me back to power songs um, that, that it kind of reminds me of. And um, although the words are very important and they talk about the atmosphere that it creates and that, that he has you know, created this feeling, he feels so strongly behind it, and he's just throwing it out there for any ear that's going to listen. And it, it, it's sort of that concept of that repetitive, um, the same spiel he gives to every person that he talks to about this. Y'all are all so smart. Do you guys have questions? Uh, Nicole.
Thank you. That's just, it's wonderful to hear and wonderful. It's a great reminder. The way you put it clarifies it really in my mind. Thank you. Questions from the audience to Tom. These are neutral questions. So what, do you, what questions do you have about the piece? Is there somebody? In? Yes. No. <laughs> so whenever I ask him, how big is the orchestra? He says, how big do you want it to be? Oh, 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 oh I, I, um, do you want to know the instrumentation? Or is that... I was just curious, you mentioned, you know, the idea of six of strings and one else uh, aria, and I was noticing the uh, moments of, of you know, the piano and the singers, and obviously it wouldn't be with the piano. I was wondering if you would talk that through, how, how you expect or, or anticipate Well, I can tell you, um, I'm heavy, <laughs> and I, I score heavily, and I know it. So I always have to. Now I'm le I'm learning my lesson finally. I, what I've learned is lighter, 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 lighter. I, I know when it comes to scoring. You know, I, I re remember reading about Benjamin Britten saying, "I I did the scoring for 13 instruments, and I'm still drowning out the singers." Now, 13. What am I going to do? 13. I'm still drowning out. So I'm certainly not going above 13. I, interestingly, I read somewhere too that Britain said it's those double reads that do it. <laughs> I, I <don't> know. <laughs> the soonest in particular. <clears throat> Any other questions? Right up there. Oh, um, Mark, you can be like, this gentleman and then you, okay? Uh, I'm just curious if the curves and the markers were matched at all during the opera, or if that's the only scene you As I envision it now, that's their only scene. But I did, you know, it. I had that same question. I went back to, should I have something near the end to wrap it up? There's something about it that appeals to me to have a minor character start the whole thing off and you never see them again. It doesn't make any sense, but maybe there's some examples in operas that I'm not familiar, you know, there's a few, but... Uh, the simpleton in Boris, I did it. It's one page of music and you're done. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I see it. I mean, you know, like medium, small. Uh -huh. I mean, I see this as a big, uh, grand thing. If you know, if it were fortunate, if I were fortunate enough, so it would have come here. Then I see it as a big thing, using as many people, because if you have a student body, you want to use as many of them as you can. Right? I want to use all of them, so they all have a part and they all have something to sing that is exciting for them. But the trick is, I want, when it's done, I want professional companies to do it. So I want to have a version that's, I mean, it's a big cast, but can it all be double, can it be cast in a way that people can play multiple roles and keep the budget uh, not insane? Um, so, but I, I definitely see it as a big, and that's part of the attraction of this competition, is that you can write for these forces that in the professional world, you might not get because, Let's face it, universities get all this cheap labor, you guys. <laughs> That's where I miss my calling. I should have worked at a university tech. I mean, it's a lot more expensive than we did there. But I would, also, I would also argue that we like a grand opera too, and there, there are places for, there's Silent Night, there's Manchurian, there are, I fell in love with, you know, Tosca and Butterfly and the big grand piece. So while I love chamber work, I also love big works for the stage too. So, yes? What about the length? The, the length. Yeah, it's a big one. This competition says 60 to 80 minutes. I'm going to, if, uh, I think this will probably, this would be 81. Um, <laughs> there's, but but I, I do have a plan for it. And uh, you know what, I'm, here's the problem. I, I, view, I view intermissions as a, an integral part of the drama. And I have two spots, I have two spots that I'm dying to put right before an intermission. So people walk out in an intermission and they talk about it and they say, what's going to, you know, that was a great moment. I can't wait till I see that next thing happen. So, so now I get the structure that's three acts and a sweep of 50 years. And so that's a, and it all has to be done. You know, if I, you know, this competition says 60 to 80 minutes, if it's it's, a, it's something that really has to be considered and some scenes that I have in my initial outline may have to go or be, or cut, be cut down. 
Yes, Sam. What am I doing? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it is a different mode, but sometimes I'm not aware of it when I do it. But then when I finish it, I mean, no, oh, this isn't a really a good song. This is more of an aria. And what is it? I'm not sure I can put it into words, but it is something about the level of character the, I mean, and the, you know, the song immediacy. You get that quick thing. You have a little more time. Maybe you don't have to give in an, in an aria for singers coming back. It doesn't have to be the whole world, you know, if they're going to have another aria in the next act. It can... It's a great question. It's a question that uh, composers much more articulate than me can have addressed. Um, I don't know the answer. I just don't. I, you know, when I talk about composing, I always say the same thing. I really don't know how it's done. I don't remember it from moment to moment. Every time I sit down, it's new. I can't remember how it's done. It's just all intuition. Sounds like the way I do budgets. Yes. <laughs> Act two. And it's interesting that that moment you cited, that is one of the moments that I, that I said, this is a moment that has to happen right before an intermission. I read, you know, we read this, I don't know, 12-page article, eight-page article. You and I both read it. We both had the same moment. He is with this woman, and at a certain point he confesses. But I have this image of these people in the institution saying, were you ever alone with this woman? You can't be alone with a girl. <laughs> And he said, yes, I was alone, and sometimes we held hands. And I said, that, th that moment is what made me think there's an opera there. That one moment, I said, that is an opera, in that one moment. I forgot the question. Yeah, so she's an act two. <laughs> is she a soprano, and does she get an aria? She gets, yeah, she gets whatever she wants. <laughs> Anybody else? Two more. Well, thank you. I've always loved to sing. I sing, um, you know, I grew up singing in choruses, always. Uh, and I sing everything I write. I think a lot of us do. I think a lot of us composers do. We sing everything we write to make sure it works. Um, I just love to sing, and uh, I grew up on listening to Sinatra and Puccini, so I've always been around the voice. Last question for Mayo's mom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, she's a figment of my imagination, really. And I couldn't make her just this uncaring, horrible person. I just, I, I, think it's much, I think it's much more touching if she loves her son. And, she, I mean, I guess she, and I'm sure she did love her son. And people are, are so often forced into these situations through ignorance or through, who knows, or circumstances where they have to make these horrible choices. And, and it's very painful, painful even to think about it. So I wanted her to be a human, and then I made this, you know, 
why did you give him up? I'm not sure I could come up with a convincing rationale. So I just wanted to hint at something and let everybody fill in their own idea and guess what it could be. And we never know. I bet Mayo lived his whole life and never knew. And it's more painful that way and more true. How many times are we told things, people tell us why they do things, and you still walk away and say, I, it doesn't make any sense, I don't understand it. It's not right. So. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you at 5 o'clock this afternoon.